He just gave us the creeps for some reason. Seemed to creep around. If he was in the backyard, we'd always come in. Well, he had no idea that he was a murderer, of course. But, uh, makes me shudder now. now. Welcome to Season 2 of Felon True Crime. Episode 1, The Schoolgirl Strangler. The city of Melbourne in the 1930s would be the backdrop for a spate of brutal crimes against young girls, the perpetrator of which would be dubbed the schoolgirl strangler. As the title suggests, this episode will include content of a violent nature. So again, listen to discretion is advised. Man is not truly one, but two. Robert Louis Stevenson The rage is always burned within. At times, it lays dormant, silent and unassuming below the surface. At times, the rage escapes its vessel and bubbles over. Dark thoughts become even darker actions. From a distance, he can see them. Inebriated, his mind is clouded, but he moves with intent. He is still cunning and calculating, and his hateful rage has found its course of release. They frolic and laugh with a youthful innocence, a stark contrast to the violent storm now brewing in his mind. Prior to this day, others had escaped his wrath. He had the opportunity, but lost his nerve. This time, the one chosen would not be spared. In the days to come, she would become entwined in a blurred memory of a playground, a walk, a bus ride, an abandoned house, his tightening grip, and then a lifeless body. Australia was hit hard by the Great Depression of the 1930s. Unemployment was high, and many families struggled to make ends meet. The Griffiths family were no exception. In 1930, Thomas Griffiths had relocated with his family to the Melbourne suburb of South Yarra, with the intention of finding employment for himself and his 18-year-old son William. The pair had been out of work for an extended period of time, and Thomas with his wife Alice had 12 children to feed. Among these children was their 12-year-old daughter, Mina. Saturday the 8th of November, 1930. Around 2.30pm, Mina and her two sisters and a school friend were given permission by Mina's mother, Alice, to play at the nearby Faulkner Park in the Melbourne suburb of South Yarra. The girls made their way to the park and spent the afternoon in the playground area. It was while playing together at this park that the four girls were approached by a strange man. He interrupted and offered them money to buy ice cream. These were simpler times and the girls took the offer as a kind gesture rather than assuming an ulterior motive. In light of their parents' financial struggles, the offer of money to enjoy some treats would be a tough one to pass up. With money in hand, they eagerly made their way towards a nearby ice cream parlour to make their purchase. As the girls began to leave the park grounds, Mina, the eldest of the group, was summoned back by the man and the others heard him say something about another job that he had a message he needed her to deliver. Thinking nothing of the request, the three girls continued on their walk to the shop where they purchased ice cream and made their way back to the park. But upon their return, the generous stranger was gone and so too was their sister and friend, Mina. Following her disappearance, Mina's eight-year-old sister Joyce and six-year-old sister Daphne hurried home and frantically relayed to their mother what had just happened at the park. Upon hearing the disturbing news, Mina's father and 18-year-old brother ran to the park and began their search. After an extended search of the park and surrounding areas, there was still no sign of Mina. Her parents, now concerned for her well-being, informed the police and Mina was listed as a missing person. A full-scale search commenced for Mina and the mystery man. The desperate hunt for missing Mina continued into the night and then into the early hours of the next morning. Mina's father and brother combed the local streets and parks. Her mother and siblings waited at home with bated breath, hoping and praying for Mina to return to them. 
Initially, the only information police had to go on was the description of the man from Joyce, Mina's eight-year-old sister. She recalled him wearing a blue suit and a bowler hat. She also had remembered seeing him loitering at the park on a number of occasions in the time leading up to Mina's disappearance. Joyce made the claim that as Mina was leaving the park with the man, that she heard him say, I want you to deliver a message and don't tell anyone you are going. Joyce said she made it known to the man and Mina that she wanted to go with them, to which he replied, No, two cannot go. Quickly dismissing Joyce, the man walked with Mina into Paisley Street and towards Commercial Road. As the investigation continued, a number of witnesses came forward and shared any information they could. A Lillian Hawk was at the park on the day of Mina's disappearance. While sitting in a parked car with her daughter, she observed a man talking to some young girls and exiting the park with one of them. A Henry Carlos claimed to have seen a man talking to four young girls, one of whom he identified as being Joyce Griffiths. Two days after Mina's disappearance, 18-year-old Harold Brockwell and 17-year-old John Brand entered an abandoned building in the nearby suburb of Ormond. The pair had been out checking birds' nests and a damaged door at the entrance of the vacant home caught their eye. Curiosity got the better of them and they made their way through the front door and along a passageway. This passage would lead them to a grim discovery. On the floor of the bathroom lay the body of a young girl. She had been stripped, bound and gagged with her own clothing. In shock, the young men ran to the nearest police station to sound the alarm. William Griffiths was called into the station to identify the body. He soon confirmed to police what they had already suspected. It was his sister, Mina. Mina's throat showed signs of being strangled. Heavy thumb imprints gouged the front of her neck. Her pants had been ripped off and used to tie her ankles together and her hands behind her back. Her panties had been removed and forced down her throat. An autopsy revealed that Mina had been bound and gagged after she had been strangled. Residents in the area were horrified by the discovery and a wave of panic spread throughout South Yarra, Ormond and surrounding suburbs. Neighbours of the abandoned home relayed to police that they had recently heard a vehicle turning around in front of the house prior to the discovery of Mina's body. Police quickly examined the tyre tracks and gathered any information they could on the mystery vehicle. Investigations quickly led police to a truck driver by the name of Robert McMahon. McMahon had spent six years in Pentridge Prison for rape and had recently been released. His appearance matched that of the description provided by Mina's sisters. In pre-trial court proceedings, Joyce Griffiths and the other witnesses who had seen a man talking to the girls at the park made a positive identification of McMahon and he was set to stand trial for the abduction and murder of Mina Griffiths. Eyewitness accounts seemed to build a tight case against him, but despite McMahon's seemingly obvious guilt, it was determined that there was not enough evidence for him to be charged, and to the dismay of Mina's family, he was allowed to walk free. Mina's parents were unable to afford a funeral to say their final farewell, but a sympathetic community rallied around the grieving family and donated more than enough to cover the expenses. On the evening of Friday the 9th of January, 1931, Nine weeks after the abduction and murder of Mina, 16-year-old Hazel Wilson, clad in a floral dress and a matching blue belt, left her family home on Melton Avenue in the suburb of Ormond. Hazel had planned to meet with a friend and continue on to a school dance where she had intended to spend the remainder of the night. She was known for being rebellious and would often test the reins of her parents by staying out late at night, so her parents were not alarmed when it reached midnight and she still had not returned home. The following morning... When Hazel failed to make an appearance at breakfast, her parents discovered that her bed had not been slept in. Conversations with Hazel's friends revealed that none of them could account for her whereabouts. It was at this point her parents began to worry. Eyewitness accounts revealed that just before midnight, Hazel had been seen with a young male friend standing outside her home smoking a cigarette. Following this sighting, she could not be accounted for. Her mother also recalled looking out a window and seeing a man carrying a package walk past the home around this time. Police, family, friends and neighbours set about searching for Hazel. It was during this frantic search that Hazel's brother Frank noticed some drag marks in the dirt not far from his home. Following these tracks led him to a gruesome discovery. In a vacant lot on Oakley Road, not far from the Wilson family home, 
he discovered a body of a young girl in a floral dress. It was Hazel. Her hands had been tied behind her back with a blue belt. Her panties had been torn into strips to tie her ankles together, and a stocking had been forced down her throat. As was the case with Mina, Hazel had also been strangled. Deep thumb impressions marked the front of her neck. What was curious to police was that an autopsy revealed that Hazel had also been bound after she was strangled. The similarities between the two murders was obvious, and police made the assumption that the same person was responsible for both. At the time of Hazel's murder, McMahon was still in custody, awaiting the trial for Mina's murder, and it was quickly determined that he could not be responsible. This, combined with alibis that confirmed he was in another state at the time of Mina's death, confirmed his innocence. Although the two murders occurred less than two kilometers or just over a mile from each other, there was no other connection between the two girls, and police were stumped for a motive. All they could conclude was that there was a killer on the loose who could quietly persuade victims to accompany him and would strangle, then bind them. In both cases, there was no sign of sexual assault, but the violent nature of the crimes led police to track down and bring in every known male with a criminal record who lived in the area. They also brought in every documented sex offender and child molester in Melbourne. With hundreds of men hauled through interrogations and all avenues of investigations exhausted, police reached a dead end. They waited anxiously, expecting to hear of another victim. But as time went on, the killer dubbed the schoolgirl strangler didn't resurface. Perhaps spooked by investigations, perhaps he had died or had been incarcerated, or perhaps he simply moved away. New Year's Day, 1935. 130 kilometers southeast of Melbourne, in the beachside town of Inverloch, a number of families gathered to celebrate the new year with a community picnic. Two young girls left this gathering and made their way to town to purchase an ice cream. 12-year-old Ethel Belshaw and her friend Margaret Knight stepped inside the shop together. Ethel purchased her ice cream and moved outside, leaving Margaret still inside the shop. In the time it took Margaret to make her selection and exit the shop, Ethel had disappeared. Margaret made her way back to the picnic to inform Ethel's parents. When there was no sign of Ethel anywhere, police were alerted, and bells were rung in the hope the missing girl would make her way to the sound if she were lost. The police, Ethel's family, locals and tourists established search parties in the hope of finding young Ethel. Searches continued well into the night, and still, there was no sign of her. The following day, a camper gathering firewood made a discovery that police and Ethel's parents had feared. It was the body of young Ethel, lying in a patch of scrub. In a manner that was disturbingly reminiscent of two cases four years prior, she had been strangled, then bound and gagged with her own clothing. It appeared that the schoolgirl strangler had resurfaced. A manhunt was swiftly launched by police. Neighbours, those attending the picnic, and friends of the family were questioned, but police were again left frustrated and without any leads. Almost a year later, on the 1st of December, 1935, in the town of Leongatha, not far from Inverloch, where Ethel Belshaw was murdered, six-year-old Shirley Steele and her friend, six-year-old June Rushmore, were approached by a man on a bike. The man offered Shirley a bag of candy if she came with him for a walk. Fearing that she would be scolded by her mother, Shirley refused to go. But June was not so reluctant and asked the man for a ride on his bike. Shirley watched her friend climb onto the handlebars of the stranger's bike and he rode away. This would be the last memory that Shirley would have of June. A day later, her tiny body was discovered lying face down in a patch of sword grass. She had been strangled, gagged and bound with her own clothing. A belt from her dress was tied over her mouth and around the back of her neck. Upon attending the scene, police soon realized that it was the work of the schoolgirl strangler. Again, investigators swooped on the town and went about trying to track down any leads they could in the hope of catching the elusive child killer. Bike tracks were found in the area and they were analyzed. Neighbors, friends and family were thoroughly interviewed, but again, to the frustration of police, it seemed they would be faced with nothing but a dead end. But the case would soon take a turn for the better. A local roadway repair laborer 
recalled seeing a man in the vicinity of the crime scene around the time June had been murdered. The man he saw bore a striking resemblance to a co-worker in his crew. In light of the high-profile investigation that was being conducted, the witness put it to the man that he had seen him in the area on the day in question. To this accusation, he instantly became hostile and denied ever being anywhere near the scene. His outburst seemed surprisingly out of character and aroused the suspicion of those who witnessed the verbal exchange, so much so that they went to the police with the name Arnold Carl Soderman. In addition to allegedly being seen in the area, it was known to a number of colleagues that Arnold Soderman owned a bike similar to that of the description investigators had released based on the tire tracks left at the scene. The news of Soderman's reaction, combined with the information about his bike, was welcomed by investigators and Soderman was taken into custody for questioning. It was not the first time Arnold had found himself sitting in front of police. Although he had stayed out of trouble in recent times, Soderman had quite a checkered past. Arnold Soderman was born to Carl and Violet Soderman in 1899. He lived in meagre conditions and his father was a violent man. In his youth, Soderman had a number of run-ins with the law. At the age of 16, he ran away from home to join the army, but was discovered just prior to training camp and forced to return home. Soon after he turned 18, he was sent to a reformatory prison for the crime of larceny. Following his release, he was charged and convicted of armed robbery for holding up and injuring a station master at the Surrey Hills Railway Station. For this crime, he received three years hard labour, during which he escaped and as a result received another year on top of his sentence. In 1922, he was released and determined to stay on the straight and narrow He travelled through various parts of the state of Victoria, working labouring jobs to make ends meet. While working as a labourer, he met and married a woman named Bernice Pope, who he affectionately referred to as Doll. Following their marriage, Bernice soon gave birth to a daughter, and they named her Joan. As the 1930s approached, and the country slipped deeper and deeper into the Great Depression, times were tough. But Arnold and Bernice managed to get by, moving around various parts of Melbourne for Arnold to find labouring jobs. Despite his colourful history, there was nothing to suggest to police that he would be capable of such violent acts against such vulnerable victims. But a detail that caught the attention of investigators was that the most recent interaction he had had with the law was an interview conducted a year prior. Due to being a neighbour of murdered schoolgirl Ethel Belshaw, and being at the same beach picnic gathering, he had been one of the men who was part of routine questioning following her murder. At that time, however, he was able to satisfy police with an alibi. An alibi that was never followed up. After 12 hours of interrogation at the local police station, Arnold Soderman finally cracked and admitted to the crime police were now sure he was guilty of. The murder of six-year-old June Rushmer And with that revelation, also came the confession to three other murders. 12-year-old Mina Griffiths, 16-year-old Hazel Wilson, and 12-year-old Ethel Belshaw. In his preceding interviews with police, Soderman calmly recounted every detail of the four murders. Soderman had been drinking at a pub near the park when Mina and her sisters were playing. He approached the girls and gave them money for ice cream persuading Mina to leave with him. While her sisters bought their ice creams, he walked Mina to a nearby bus stop. The pair took the bus south and stopped in the suburb of St Kilda, where he purchased some fish and chips for her to eat. They then boarded another bus and travelled south towards the suburb of Ormond. He walked with her to a vacant house on Wheatley Road, and once out of the public view, grabbed her around the neck and pressed his thumbs tightly against her throat. He squeezed until young Mina's small lifeless body fell to the ground. He then proceeded with his ritual of binding and gagging her. Nine weeks later, after a long session of drinking, Soderman stumbled upon 16-year-old Hazel Wilson, who was smoking a cigarette out the front of her home. The pair struck up a conversation, Soderman gaining her trust 
so he could walk with her away from her home and to a nearby vacant lot. Once out of sight and earshot of neighbours, Soderman pounced on Hazel and proceeded to strangle her. She thrashed and Soderman squeezed tighter and tighter until, like Mina, Hazel's body fell lifeless to the ground. Soderman dragged her from the street to the back of the vacant lot and for the second time carried out the ritual of binding and gagging the body. Four years later, Soderman had relocated with his wife and daughter to the town of Leongatha, 130 kilometres south of Melbourne. He and his family were among the families who had gathered at the nearby beach town of Inverloch for the New Year's celebration picnic. Soderman was a neighbour of Ethel Belshaw's family, and the two knew each other well. He had spent the day at the local hotel drinking. It was while Ethel waited for a friend at the front of an ice cream shop that Soderman struck up a conversation with her and convinced her to accompany him on a bushwalk. The two walked through the jetty and up through the scrub. Soderman claimed that while walking along the narrow track away from the beach that something came over him and he instantly seized Ethel by the throat. Once he knew she was dead, he dragged her body further into the scrub in an attempt to conceal his crime. He returned to the picnic and joined his and Ethel's family where he would feign concern over the news of her disappearance. Prior to the discovery of Ethel's body, Soderman invited her distraught parents over for tea. He was then among those who were questioned over her whereabouts when Ethel went missing. He admitted to seeing her on the day of the murder, but claimed she was alive and well the last time he saw her. Police, satisfied with his responses, allowed him to go without any further questioning. A detail they would come to regret. On the 1st of December, 1935, Arnold Soderman came across two six-year-olds walking along the side of the road. Soderman had spent the morning drinking and was out on his bike prowling the streets. After Shirley Steele refused to accompany him, Soderman turned his sights to her friend, June Rushmer. Soderman was a work colleague of her father's and so he was not a complete stranger to the girl. She requested a ride on his bike and he was happy to oblige. Admitting to police that once she had climbed on the handlebars, he had made up his mind that he would murder her. He pedalled along the road and into some bushland. Once behind the blanket of trees and scrub, he prompted her to dismount and made a run towards her. June, spooked by his sudden movement, ran from him into the bush, but her tiny legs could not carry her fast enough, and Soderman caught her and for the fourth time strangled his victim until he felt her body go limp and she fell to the ground. She was then bound and gagged and would lie face down in the bush until being discovered a day later. She would be the final victim of the schoolgirl strangler. As part of his confession, Soderman made a desperate plea that he had not been in control of his actions when he had committed the murders and that when he drank liquor, an uncontrollable rage would come over him, driving him to kill. Part of this written confession read, I will be 36 years of age on Thursday the 12th of November, 1935. I tell this story not with any hope of reward or in the hope of easing my position, but because of the grip the mania has on me. When in this state, thoughts would go through my mind concerning men, women and children whom I disliked. They were mostly men. I would feel the desire to even it up, not caring what happened to them, but I would shake it off. As soon as the liquor wore off, I could reason properly and would wipe it all off. I always realise after what I have done. I cannot say I'm satisfied, I just wake up. I do not think of doing these things when I am sober. The news of the murders was devastating to his precious doll, Bernice, and she struggled to accept that Arnold, her husband, and father of her daughter, was capable of such atrocities. But when authorities looked into Soderman's family history, it seemed to provide some answers. Research indicated that Soderman's family tree was riddled with mental illness. His father was an abusive man whose last years of his life were spent in Mont Park Mental Hospital. His mother suffered regular bouts of amnesia. His paternal grandfather died in Kew Mental Hospital 
and his grandfather's brother died in a German mental asylum. It was also documented that his great-grandfather and his great-grandfather's brother suffered various forms of mental illness. This genetic history, combined with a traumatic childhood and living conditions, seemed to be a catalyst for his violent behaviour. Although Soderman was able to play the role of an attentive father and husband, simmering below the surface was a monster that would be released when he drank. He was not one man, but two, a Jekyll and a Hyde. When Soderman went to trial, he had a government medical officer, Dr. A. J. W. Philpot, his assistant, Dr. R. T. Allen, and a psychiatrist, Dr. Reginald Ellery, in his corner. All three gave evidence that Soderman was suffering from a disorder of the mind, which created what they called an obsessional impulse of such power that under the influence of alcohol, he was no longer responsible for his behavior. They argued that since Soderman was intoxicated on all four occasions, that he was insane at the times of the murders. This theory was reinforced not only by Soderman's repetitive behavior, but also by his family's troubled medical history. Despite these claims delivered by the doctors, the jury rejected Soderman's defense of insanity and he was sentenced to death by hanging. On the 1st of June, 1936, Arnold Carl Soderman was hanged and buried at Pentridge Prison, Coburg. With his death would come more of an insight into his condition. An autopsy discovered that he was suffering from leptomeningitis, a degenerative disease that could cause serious congestion of the brain when aggravated by alcohol. Soderman had carried with him in anger for a long period of time. In his confession, he recounted that he had made two earlier attempts to kill, the first a young girl, and another time a young boy. He claimed in these initial attempts, he had come to his senses before it was too late, and he let them go. In the case of the young boy, he had lured him into a shed and was about to strangle him. But when he realized what he was doing, he released the boy and fled the scene. While fleeing, a passerby thinking the pace of his running suspicious tackled him to the ground and police were alerted. In talking to police, Soderman claimed that he'd been drinking and needed to relieve himself behind the shed. His details were taken and he was free to go. The attending officer, unaware of the savage crimes he would go on to commit. In 2012, a commemorative service was held to mark the 75th anniversary of the death of Ethel Belshaw and June Rushmer. Due to the limited finances of the families of the two girls, they never had a proper headstone marking their place of burial. And so in 2012, their short lives were remembered with bronze plaques being placed on their grave sites. The memorials were donated by the Australian Funeral Directors Association in conjunction with the Herald Sun. AFDA Victorian representative Tom Dooley said that after being approached by the Herald Sun and learning of how the girls died, the association was moved to restore dignity and recognition of their lives. Ethel Belshaw's niece, Bronwyn Butler, attended the service and said it was a special moment for the Belshaw family, but she expressed disappointment. Her father wasn't alive to see it. Her father, Harold Belshaw, was 15 when his younger sister was murdered. A lasting memory that Harold shared with Bronwyn before his death was that he vividly remembered Arnold Soderman inviting his family over for tea the night Ethel went missing, all the while carrying the secret that he was responsible for her death. The anniversary of the murder of Ethel also stirred some troubling memories for Maureen Lewis. Maureen was a neighbor of the Sodermans and recalls being invited by Arnold Soderman to go for an ice cream on the same day that Ethel was murdered. The only reason that she did not go with him was that Arnold's wife said he could only go on the condition he took their daughter Joan with them, to which he refused. We lived next door to Soderman's and I went to Inverloch with them the day he murdered Ethel Belshaw. And when we were down there, he wanted to take me for an ice cream, but his wife wouldn't let him, Mrs Soderman wouldn't let him unless he took his daughter Joan. Maureen also recalls that even as a child, there seemed something about Arnold Soderman that wasn't quite right. You'd turn around and he'd be behind you in sand shoes. And in those days, people didn't wear sand shoes or runners. Like with ordinary trousers. And Dad just didn't wear them, only to tennis or sport. But he seemed to, seemed to creep around. If he was in the backyard, we'd say, oh, well, Soderman's out the back. 
and would always come in. Well, he had no idea that he was a murderer, of course. Yeah, it uh, makes me shudder now. For those wishing to read more about the case, I'd recommend the books Arnold Soderman, The True Story of the Schoolgirl Strangler by Jack Rosewood, and also Australia's Serial Killers by Paul B. Kidd, both of which are available in hard copy or digital formats. Thanks for listening. What happened with Soderman's case, interestingly, is that after, uh, after he was hung, they did an autopsy and found that his brain was, uh, had been uh, diseased, it was quite deteriorated. Um, that may have come about for two reasons. One is, uh, or for three reasons perhaps. Uh, one was the family, the genetics issue. Uh, the second was uh, that he at one point had suffered a fairly extensive head injury. And the third was he was a great drinker and uh, alcohol was a big problem. Now each one of those may, uh, attributed, may have attributed to the, uh, to the brain dysfunction, but certainly in combination uh, it's quite apparent that he had a brain dysfunction, but it wasn't assessed until, or wasn't in fact picked up until the autopsy.